you, everyone in the audience. Thank you, panel members. Great pleasure to be here this afternoon at Bard College uh, and to meet with you. Um, I'm going to use my position as moderator to talk for uh, two or three minutes before uh, we hear from our panelists. We're going to have this session, the afternoon, divided into two halves. The first half, essentially, we're going to talk about what our panelists think might be possible futures in Tibet, for Tibet. And the second half, we'll move on to other topics, perhaps how to realistically achieve those kind of futures that they are hoping for. Uh, and then we'll open it up uh, the last half hour or so, or, or more of the afternoon, for discussion with you, the audience. Um, I want to use my position as moderator to say a, a few words to remind us of the, mor the contours, uh, the moral contours of free speech and of discussing these kind of issues. The issue we're about to talk about this afternoon is highly emotive. We stand here this afternoon uh, with the news that over 100 people have self-immolated, have set themselves on fire within Tibet and several outside Tibet. Over 80 of those people have died uh, doing so. Uh, more people will follow. There is an ex inexorable logic to the practice of self-immolation that it tends to continue until a solution is arrived at. Uh, so we face a kind of crisis, uh, a decline in the Tibet-China dispute towards uh, conflict and uh, disaster. Uh, that, however, is not to say that we are talking about another Palestine. There are really important differences between this issue and the, many of the other terrible issues we see around the world. And one important difference is that the level of ethnic hatred within Tibet, or within China, between Tibetans and Chinese, is remarkably low. Uh, and that means that the hope of a solution is much closer than in many other issues. A compromise has been proposed uh, many times, has not been completely successful, as we all know. But we're not completely removed from that possibility. But this possibility can change. And as we enter this crisis, which is marked by these terrible deaths from burning, uh, we can see a danger of us declining more towards conflict uh, and hatred. And so here this afternoon, we also have a responsibility uh, not to encourage that decline, but to maintain the kind of standards that we all, I think, will feel are appropriate to uh, an important university like this, uh, to many of you who are Buddhists, uh, the, the standards that come with the ideals of tolerance, the standards that come with the effort to find solutions rather than deepen conflict. And I say this because we see already signs in the Congress, some congressmen from the very far right of uh, Congress uh, have started to write public letters denouncing, in effect, those who support the Dalai Lama as being uh, fellow collaborators uh, with communists, uh, betrayers, and so on. So already we can see that the atmosphere is becoming more contentious. Um, so I want to mention a couple of roadmap guidelines for discussion uh, for all of us in this room uh, when we talk about this issue. One is something that the Dalai Lama increasingly has reminded people of, at least last year, several times. A government is not a people. We're not here to talk about the people. We're here to talk about what governments do. So that's a distinction I think is important. We don't want to be saying the Chinese think this or the Tibetans do that. We're here, Tibetans and Chinese, like any race or nationality, they don't really exist. They're many different people with many different views. But governments do exist, and governments are the people we're talking about here. Secondly, when we talk about allegations of serious abuse, which sometimes have to be made, we have to remember we do not know a huge amount about these. We, I think what we hear from our reports is substantially correct, but we have to be careful. We don't know very much. Uh, we know that very serious things are happening, but we still have to consider that these are reports most of us have little 
first-hand knowledge of the complexities of these things. Uh, most of us uh, have not been able to go to Tibet for many years, if at all. I haven't been allowed for five or six years, uh, and many of us are in the same situation. Thirdly, uh, one of the useful ways to avoid uh, inflammatory discussion is to separate facts from intentions. We do have pretty good evidence of facts on the ground, what's happening, what policies are, but we don't know the intentions behind those policies. So let's be cautious when we ascribe the intentions of officials, whether we're talking about Tibetans or Chinese, we never know people's intentions. They may have good intentions, they may be wrong, but we should be careful to go there and we should try to stick to what we know of the facts. And finally, one of the things that inflames discussion is blurring the past with the present. Sometimes we should do that, but many times we should be very careful to remember that what happened under Mao in China, really extraordinarily serious abuses of unimaginable dimensions, uh, is not really the situation we're talking about now. So we try to be precise. When are we talking about events in the last 30 years, and when are we talking about events in the Maoist period? Let's not visit the sins of the fathers on their sons, uh, so to speak. These are things we can discuss, but these are some of the highlights that uh, I think will help us to find ways to discuss these issues so that we can hear many sides. So let's proceed. We're going to begin here by thinking about the future of Tibet. I think everyone in this room roughly knows the present situation. It is very serious. Many, many people feel huge anxiety uh, and perhaps even, as we can guess, desperation about the situation in Tibet. Um, but what's the future like? We very hear, rarely hear discussions of the future. Uh, what could be the possibilities uh, for a future situation uh, with China, with Tibet? So I'm going to invite our four panelists to talk for just four minutes each uh, uh, to lay out what they see as this future. Uh, I'm going to begin by inviting our distinguished representative of the Dalai Lama, Lob Sang Yenda, please. <clears throat> thank you very much, Ravi, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, in fact, you know, I always feel that uh, your presence here is simply because you care about Tibet, you are concerned about the plight of Tibetan situation, and uh, also I feel that your presence here is an expression of your solidarity, uh, you know, to the Tibetan cause. So from the deep of my, you know, heart, I really wanted to express my sincere appreciation to all of you and the parts uh, on, and the organizers, uh, the Tibetan Center and the Bard College. Uh, speaking about future is, in fact, very challenging. Uh, you know, it's a. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, many people uh, are fond of speaking about uh, future of Tibet, and uh, there are a group of people who uh, strongly believes that the future of Tibet is fully, you know, dependent on the future of China. Uh, but then, you know, those people also have a different opinions in terms of uh, whether you know, the rise of China would benefit more for the Tibetan people or the fall of China. And uh, there is a school of thought who believes that, you know, the 21st, 21st century belongs to China. And that China is going to supersede even the United States much before 2030. And also there is another group of you know, people who believes that uh, you know, China has already started declining and uh, we can see a collapse of China in the very foreseeable future. But what I believe is that even though the changes in China is definitely going to impact the future of Tibet, but what is more important and what can really make more impact to the future of Tibet is the what course of action the Tibetan people will take. What kind of you know, uh, approach would Tibetan people would take in terms of 
accomplishing our common goal. So that's you know uh, my kind of understanding of uh, you know future uh, realization of the Tibetan people. And secondly, I believe it's more to do with the determination of the Tibetan people. And uh, every one of us do agree that Tibetans are very much determined with in our resistance against injustices and the Chinese Communist regime. And we have been, over the last now more than 60 years, we have been very strongly, uh, Tibetans have proven that uh, Tibetans are not happy under the Chinese rule. We have made it very clear time and again to the Chinese leaders as, as well as to the Chinese, uh, to, to the international community. So with this kind of determination, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, Robbie talked to you about the, uh, the prevailing situation inside Tibet, how Tibetans are being now uh, repressed uh, by the Chinese authorities. So, we can see that it's not only the Tibetan people and the international community who consider situation in Tibet as urgent. I have heard and I have learned that even the Chinese top leaders are also considering Tibet situation as urgent and extremely important. And I was also told that the last official document signed by Hu Jintao is the document on Tibet. And similarly, the first official document signed by the new leader, Xi Jinping, is also on Tibet. So it remains has to be seen what that document contains. Is that document to do with more repression in, in, in Tibet or to Tibetan people? Or is that document is concerned about finding a solution to the Tibet problem? So what I'm saying is that when the Chinese leaders are taking this issue at a very kind of you know, uh, important level, which means it's all to do with the determination and the, you know, the approach that Tibetans have been taking over the number of years now. So uh, that's one thing. And uh, secondly, the important thing about you know, what Tibetan people would uh, uh, you know, uh, do about future of Tibet, I, I would say that Tibetans in the past uh, 60 years, we have invested so much on uh, you know, modern education, so much on preservation of Tibetan culture and you know, uh, identity. We have uh, invested on Tibetan democracy. So in addition to this, I would also say that His Holiness has very carefully laid uh, groundwork for future. And even in recent times, His Holiness has uh, you know, uh, made two historic decisions. One is to devolve, devolving his you know, political authorities. Uh, that is simply to empower the political leadership of the Tibetan people and also to you know, ensure the continuity of the freedom struggle of the Tibetan movement. That's one thing. And second important decision that he made was issuing a very clear statement about the next reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. So they, there is no room for manipulation you know, from the Chinese uh, you know, communist side. So having said that, now what goal the Tibetan leadership, including his holiness, is you know, hoping to achieve? That is pretty clear to the international community. We have had this five-point peace plan proposal. We have had this uh, Strasbourg proposal. We even have this, uh, the, the memorandum on genuine uh, autonomy for Tibetan people, uh, so which all calls for a self-rule uh, that respect the Tibetan national identity of the Tibetan people. So the only thing how to achieve that genuine autonomy status from the Chinese government is, as I said, international community pressure is something that is very important, but at the same time, support from the Chinese community, Chinese people, and determination of the Tibetan people are extremely important to achieve the common goal, that is the genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, uh, we should move secondly to our most senior scholar on the panel, Professor Thurman. Let's have your views, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Well, all right. Senior, I will 
except being senior nowadays, I have to. So uh, the future of Tibet. Uh, I want to thank the Tibetan Center for organizing this event and um, my colleagues for showing up and, uh, and uh, Losan Yen Dahla for his very excellent, I think, and judicious statement. I learned something from that. Uh, in my view, the future of Tibet is very bright, just as the present of Tibet is very dark. We're in a situation that is truly dreadful now, I think, and any attempt to say that it isn't is, uh, is fudging the issue. Uh, because there are the two factions that um, Losan Yandala mentioned, the ones who say that the 21st century is China's, that is, the sort of the Chinese imperium is going to be the empire of the 21st century. That's a real faction in China. And there are many people outside. Maybe Henry Kissinger is part of that faction. I'm not sure. He could be. They, their saying goes, the 19th century was Britain, 20th century was US, 21st century is China. They will conquer everybody. That faction is behaving badly in Tibet. And Tibetans are like the canaries in the mine shaft about the danger of that faction. If they persist, we will have a world war without question. Uh, but the problem that that faction has is that the technology of warfare today is beyond the ability of anybody to have a world war, thank goodness. Or rather, beyond the ability of anybody to win one, I to put it that way. They could still have one, <laughs> just press a bunch of buttons. But to win one, to, to emerge the victor of a world conflict with the current technology is not possible. So I think that kind of cycle of whose century is it, whose empire and all this is actually nonsense. Luckily, and I think cooler heads in China will prevail, and they will not really launch this campaign that they dearly think about. Therefore, then that brings you back to Tibet, uh, one back to Tibet itself and the role of Tibet. I think the Tibet will uh, be recognized by the, this more wise leadership in China, which will come from somewhere. I hope it's Xi Jinping, but I don't know who it is. Really, and they will realize that, like Hong Kong has been a success for them to some extent, by one country, two systems. In Hong Kong, they have shown they have the ability, the Chinese Communist Party has shown they have the ability to hold on to something without strangling it, without strangling the golden goose to get the whole goose and eat it. And instead, they get more eggs. They realize that there's a possibility of doing that. Once they learn to do that there, shown that they can do that there, they could possibly do that with Tibet, honor their own constitution. And if they honor their own constitution, they would realize that the population transfer of Chinese settlers upon a minority area, which is what the whole Tibetan plateau is, would be, uh, is illegal according to their own constitution. They cannot smother them in a majority Han, what they call Han, Chinese population. And um, similarly, they do not know how to manage the very delicate ecosystem of Tibet, the high altitude headwaters of their own rivers, headwaters of the Mekong, Salween, Irrawaddy, Brahmaputra, Ganges, Indus, all of the major rivers of India. They are ruining by trying to overpopulate Tibet, by desertifying the steppe, by cutting the wood. And um, they, they should not do, allow their people to do that. They should turn it back over to the stewardship of the Tibetan people who know how to live in that altitude, who can live there year round without being sick, as they cannot, and who, know, who have not disturbed the, uh, the glaciers, who have not disturbed the flow of water and so forth into all the Asian countries for thousands of years. And so that is an internationally desirable and necessary thing for three billion plus people. And I think that wise leadership in China will realize that. And one country, two systems will be extended to Tibet. And, and therefore, there is a win-win in this for China and Tibet by Chinese coming to the, realize that they need to be a federation, like the Russian Federation. They cannot be a single nation. They cannot crush minorities like Mongolians, Uyghurs, Tibetans, and even Manchus, although they're more or less invisible nowadays, but they cannot crush them into a Han mold, into a Chinese mold. And uh, they need to show, and also to show the world, that they, as I say, can coexist with a group that is federated with them without crushing them and doing that. The plan for this, 
Uh, I outlined it myself. His Holiness has outlined in many different talks, and I think the negotiators with the Chinese finally produced a white paper where they more or less showed what they what the Holiness had asked for. And in, I wrote a book in 2008 called Why the Dalai Lama Matters, in which I promised Hu Jintao his own personal Nobel Peace Prize. I guaranteed it to him, not on the basis of my awarding of it. Unfortunately, I do not award it. I wish I did. But <clears throat> I, I would take it away from a few people who've gotten it in the past, actually. And, uh, but I would definitely give it to somebody. But I, show, I proved to Hu Jintao that if he had befriended the Dalai Lama, reversed the stupid old-fashioned policy of trying to pretend that the most popular man on the planet is a demon with horns, as His Holiness likes to joke, and is somebody that everybody should shun, which they failed to do because everybody likes the Dalai Lama, and he's a very sensible and commonsensical person. So give that up, befriend the Dalai Lama, see what the Dalai Lama really is asking for on behalf of his people, and satisfy what they want. And then in exchange, get the voluntary participation in a Chinese federation by the Tibetan people. And in that light, also solve the Uyghur problem, the Mongolian problem, and the Taiwan problem by proving to people who have had a bitter experience with Chinese imperialism, uh, recent imperialism, proving that they can get along in a federal way with other people, and one like they did in Hong Kong. One country, two systems. If you can do one country, two systems, why not one country, three systems, one country, four systems, one country, five systems? There's no reason that they cannot do it. That is the modern way, transparency, media, and so on. If they get proper public relations advice, they will definitely do that, and in that case, they will... They will, it will be a wonderful benefit for them, and the world will have a reason to believe this peaceful rising slogan that Hu Jintao liked to mouth, but the Chinese have not shown any sign of peacefully rising, actually. They are, they are very aggressively rising so far. So, uh, and then this will also, I think, help them internally with their own people by having more outlet, more free media, more free assembly, uh, maybe multi-party system eventually, as in Russia, and then they will and then they'll be part of the, of the new world that we're going to have, in which Tibet will be a very important contributor on the basis of environmental reality, on the basis of spiritual reality, on the basis of democratic reality, and finally returning Tibet to being the water tower of Asia, functioning in a healthy way, letting the waters flow down from there, and uh, keeping uh, the people in all the river valleys uh, healthy and happy. Uh, this is what is necessary. This is what Tibet's contribution has been for thousands of years and will continue to be after the current mess has been cleaned up, which I'm sure it will be. I have no doubt about it. But, but that is in, t in terms of saying that, I want you to sh be aware that in, when I say that, I'm not at all saying that the current situation is all rosy because that would be untrue. It is a terrible situation as the 104 to 105, I think, self-sacrificing Tibetans have shown by putting their, consigning themselves to flames to draw the world's attention to the, uh, the unsatisfactoriness of the current situation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Professor Mingxia, great honor to have you here with us this afternoon. What are your thoughts? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to ask uh, one question is, um, when we look at uh, more than 100 safe uh, emulators, especially on Valentine's Day, and uh, since February uh, 2009, the number of uh, safe emulators reached 100. I think this is very ironic and also sent us a strong uh, message, and it's a very urgent call. So one question is, what uh, is the audience and the, uh, did the emulators they have in their mind? And I think clearly the audience includes uh, the international community, but also the Chinese. So one uh, big question is and how uh, have the Chinese react to the safe emulations? And, uh, and I want to say uh, one thing is, uh, and part of the uh, uh, magazine, uh, here is I Sometimes, it just started in, uh, in October uh, in Hong Kong. And so this is uh, a Chinese magazine. And so this is the first time in Chinese uh, news magazines they have had these feature discussions on the safe emulation. And so I think this is uh, something uh, very positive and the Chinese scholars and the Chinese uh, intellectuals, they are paying attention. So the safe emulation has become is one of the issues on the uh, agenda for the Chinese intellectuals. And so now um, the question is, 
whether um, the Tibetan uh, problem, this is a problem of China. And uh, um, I think and, uh, 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 it can be yes and uh, it can be no. Because I think and the Tibetan problem and, uh, was created not only by the Chinese invasion in 1950, and I think it was also created by the geopolitical uh, uh, competitions in the Himalaya region and around the year 1950. And so um, I remember when I met uh, 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 another professor at the University of uh, Chicago, uh, John Kelly, and he has done research on uh, minority issues in uh, that region. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned one thing that's very important. He said, and when you look at Tibetan issues, and don't forget, and in that region, from uh, uh, Vietnam to Burma, and uh, to India, and to China, Tibet, even to Afghanistan, even to uh, uh, the Muslims, the Uyghur, and in China, and maybe we can even go to uh, Turkestan and, uh, uh, and Turks. And so you have the competition between the uh, 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 nation states and the Highlander uh, minorities. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a big is the issue, so it's not only about you see, China here. And so uh, how this uh, problem was created, and I think and, uh, uh, Tibet was caught in between both India and China. And we know uh, Nehru and uh, his uh, 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 socialist vision, I think to some extent, compromised the interest of uh, uh, Tibet. And uh, so the uh, Tibetan uh, problem, I think, to some extent, was created and by India, by China, and, uh, and to some extent, we can say, and His Holiness, and when he talked about socialism, and he had some and unfulfilled expectation about uh, socialism, and the socialism from uh, Mao Zedong and from China. So this is what I want to uh, uh, mention. So now, uh, what's the way out? Clearly, if a uh, Tibetan problem is uh, 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 created by several factors, and China is one, so clearly the solution has to come from uh, also from uh, China. So what can the Chinese do? And so uh, what uh, 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 Tibetans really want? And so uh, here I want to uh, have one uh, idea, because I think at this moment the Chinese uh, government, uh, the Chinese uh, regime, I think has lost uh, the ability of reasoning. And they do not reason anymore. And so since I have only four minutes, I cannot elaborate on that. And so the problem is, I don't think uh, I have any expectation from the uh, Chinese current regime. And so I'm very pessimistic about the current regime. And, uh, and I, but I, I do think, and uh, uh, I see hope from the Chinese uh, ongoing democratization uh, process. And I think since the year 2008, and the democratization process has picked up steam. And uh, unfortunately, and now more and more uh, people they have been either ejected by the regime to become part of the opposition forces, or they voluntarily to, ch uh, to choose to stay away from the uh, uh, ruling elite and to give up the perks they could claim. And so this is what I uh, expect, and uh, we are going to see a, a major change in Chinese society in the coming and years. And so now the question is, what uh, do the Tibetans want? And I don't think and the Tibetans, they can get whole sovereignty. And I think the whole sovereignty, the independence of Tibet, and with a sovereign uh, uh, state, I think it's very unrealistic. To some extent, it's like the Chinese, they're so fetish of the whole sovereignty of uh, China. And I think uh, my uh, uh, vision is here, or my reading of the future is, and uh, um, I think the um, a happy uh, ending will be like, uh, now we talk about the um, a wedding cake uh, governance. And so um, we are going to say, and in China, as Professor uh, Thurman mentioned, and how they are going to have this multi-centered, multi-layered governance. And so you are going to have uh, Han Chinese and to live uh, in peace with uh, other minority people, and also with the uh, 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 Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong and uh, Macau and entities. So this is what I uh, uh, believe, and we are going to think about and, uh, uh, and the citizenship and uh, for the Tibetans more in a post-national uh, perspective. We cannot just uh, think and uh, uh, Tibet if they uh, uh, gain a nationhood, and uh, so uh, if they have full uh, citizenship, and everything will be you see, in the great. And I think and uh, to uh, uh, pursue whole sovereignty and uh, uh, citizenship, and not in the post-national citizenship uh, uh, context, I think could be suicidal and also could be disastrous. And so I think, and I'm happy to, uh, to uh, hear, and, uh, and His Holiness and also has made it very clear, and we uh, are asking for the middle way, right? So I think the middle way strategy, to some extent, 
I think will be you see, better implemented uh, by this post-national citizenship and in a multi-centered, multi-tier and uh, uh, governance. But how we are going to get there, and I think and the solution comes also from part of China, so that's the democratization process of uh, Chinese politics. Okay, stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tenzing Dorje, leader of Students for Free Tibet, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Robbie. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. I'm just going to set a timer. La, dixere. Los. I, my thoughts are a little, little bit different from uh, uh, some of the previous uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, I have the honor of joining on the panel. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's actually uh, you know, a vision that is very common among a lot of Tibetans, uh, especially many uh, uh, of the new generation of Tibetans also, uh, which is uh, the vision of uh, free Tibet, the vision of an independent Tibet. And, uh, and I think among uh, many of the supporters of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's middle way policy and approach, uh, among many supporters also, I think the question about you know, whether we desire independence, I think there is no question at all. Uh, I think that's understood among everyone that for Tibetan people, in a vacuum, if we were told what would you choose, uh, there is no question about the answer. Uh, but given the realistic situation of geopolitics and the uh, many of the unconditional, uh, you know, un unfavorable conditions uh, of today's world, uh, people uh, suddenly face much more challenge in terms of um, deciding what my personal demand should be, what our official demand should be, and there was a lot of uh, debate and uh, discussion about this. Uh, at the same time, I would also like to make clear that uh, sometimes uh, in the rest of the world, um, when people who talk about the Tibet issue also discuss it in, in the sense of a big divide between the middle way approach versus the independence approach, I wouldn't call this a divide or a huge misunderstanding or anything. It's actually um, uh, very much of a intellectual debate within the community and of course it's an emotional issue for everyone. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, it's important to note that uh, from both sides, you know, this discussion has been very uh, respectful, I think. Uh, and uh, I think in, in general, um, one of the main reasons that sometimes makes it difficult for us to imagine a free Tibet is the size of the Chinese empire and the apparent strength and the, you know, intransigence of this empire. Um, and that, that plays one of the big roles in geopolitics, you know, seeing a geopolitics that is very unfavorable to the achievement of a free Tibet. Uh, but I'd like to, you know, go back 100 years. Like, we live in a time of many different anniversaries, you know, many symbolic anniversaries. Um, there were more than 100 self-immolations inside Tibet uh, since 2009. Uh, just a few days ago, we commemorated the 100th anniversary of the restoration of Tibetan independence in 1913, and at that time, uh, the, it was the Manchu Empire that invaded Tibet in 1910, and the 13th Dalai Lama actually escaped to exile at the time. And the 13th Dalai Lama actually went to three different countries. He went to exile three times, um, and it was, the exile that we live in right now, it was a situation that had happened before too, although the, many of the other conditions were also different at that time. Um, but basically, I think there are lessons we can look in that uh, historical uh, reestablishment of Tibetan independence. And right now, you know, when we are in a situation like this, I think a free Tibet or an independent Tibet, it's, we, it's important for us to look at the situation outside the parameters of what the Chinese government tells us. And to look at the possibility and probability of the Chinese empire's decline. And when we look at all the past empires around the world, whether it's the British Empire or the Roman Empire, and, and someone like the British Empire, they had the institutional strength, the democratic strength, uh, the, you know, the capacity, all of these things going forward, and it wasn't able to maintain its empire a stretch. And for the Chinese empire, we shouldn't equate the Chinese empire with the Chinese nation because the Chinese nation is a really rich, 
a beautiful nation that will go on living, that will continue for a long time. But the Chinese empire is completely different from the Chinese nation. And Russia was able to emerge out of the Soviet Union. The Russian nation continues. The Russian people continues. And I see a future where the Chinese people and the Chinese nation will actually emerge out of the, uh, this monstrosity called the PRC, come out of this and reclaim China's own nationality, their own culture and long, rich civilization and history and tradition. And that would be the moment when many of these other nations would also emerge victorious. And I think, um, I refuse to believe that Tibet will only be free if China becomes democratic or free. Uh, one of our very good friends, Xiao Zhang, who is a Chinese scholar, uh, he often says, China will only be free if Tibet becomes free. And uh, I think the Tibetan people, uh, the way people are resisting right now and the way people are carrying on the struggle for freedom, it's one of those uh, you know, true inspirations for the rest of the world and for the Chinese people that sometimes the Chinese people tell Tibetans that they need Tibetan people in their struggle because there's so much they can learn from it. And I think it goes both ways, you know. But I think, uh, like Professor Thurman said, uh, I think there is the possibility of a future where Tibet is a free, independent nation that safeguards the water tower of Asia, that secures peace between the two most populous nations on the planet, and at the same time liberate the entire Chinese people from this tormented conscience of your own government and country oppressing another government. And we look at the British, uh, the British people today and ask them, are you happy that the British government, the British Empire let go of India and all your colonies? And they are the first ones to be thankful that at one point their own government made this difficult decision to let go. And it is the same for the Chinese people and the Chinese government. Today, many of the Chinese people might feel uncomfortable about letting go of something that they have been told belongs to them, but years from now, I think the Chinese people will eventually become the most thankful and grateful that at a certain point in history, Tibet became a free country and China also became a free nation. Thank you. Thank you. So we have four different views, quite distinct in many ways. We have a, a view of Tibet having self-rule, some kind of higher degree, meaningful autonomy within China. We have a, a, a view from Professor Thurman of, of a China becoming a kind of federal, federated entity, a changing its, its whole makeup to be federal based on the Hong Kong model, roughly speaking. From Ming Xia, we have the idea of China becoming democratic, that it moves towards democracy, and this could produce a solution. And from Tendor, uh, as you heard, we have what I think we could call a, a, a decolonization vision, an idea that China lets go of Tibet uh, and allows Tibet to be independent in some way, four different views. Well, I, I want to put this question to our panel and to let them uh, rebut my suggestion I don't see China agreeing to do any of these. Let's say China, why should China agree to do any of these? Uh, all of these would perhaps threaten its unity. It could lead to uh, Uyghurs and other peoples, Mongolians making demands as well. Mongolians, uh, Uyghurs and Tibetans, roughly speaking, uh, inhabit 60 or something like 58% of China's territory. It's a very important area. Why would China want to make these concessions? Uh, allowing Tibet to be independent or allowing to China to uh, set up a federal system might create huge instability. So I want to ask our panelists this question. Why do they think China would want to do this without it being short of it being forced to do it? Love San Yenda, please. Uh, you know, I think from the uh, communist Chinese point of view, they would definitely not want to have a federal system nor would they welcome a democratic uh, you know, structure in China, nor would they allow a free Tibetan uh, you know, uh, uh, Tibet, but they would definitely 
from my point of view, you know, in the near future, agree to the proposal that the Tibetan leadership have made over the past now almost 20 years. And our proposal, obviously, is in accordance with the Chinese constitution. We are not asking that is not already there in the constitution of China. So it's a matter of you know, a political will. What Tibetans are asking is to preserve, I won't say the entire Tibetan, but the position of the Tibetan government in exile. What we are demanding is that Tibetans be free to protect and preserve their own mm -hmm. national identity. And that would mean a genuine self-rule where Tibetans could uh, you know, have a free hand in education, in health, in, in, in domestic affairs, in economy, you name it, except for the military and defense. So which we are trying to kind of you know, uh, convince the Chinese authorities that the sovereignty over Tibet is still intact. The, the territorial integrity is still intact within China, so we are not threatening in any way, apart from the Chinese leadership, to accept and respect the aspirations of the Tibetan people. Thank you. Please, the other panelists. Professor. You want me to speak? Um, well, I have a counter question, Ravi. Mm. Uh, why would the Soviet Union? want to let walk out of Eastern Europe, let go of the Ukraine and Kazakhstan and the Baltic states. Why would they do that? They have, everyone said, oh, they have no intention of doing such a thing. Why, why would they? You know, that's a counter question. In other words, China, my answer would be China doesn't actually exist. It's a construct. There is no person with a, it's like, except for the United States Supreme Court, China Inc., a giant corporation, is uh, not a person, except for, as I said, our own Supreme Court might award them personhood so they can make campaign contributions. But otherwise, it's not a person. There's uh, seven members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo and another like 20 or 30 guys hanging around in the ante room smoking cigarettes and making, you know, playing a game with each other, who's tougher, who should have power, who should do this, who should do that. And how do we hang on to our power? And they're a total walking paradox. They're communists. People's Republic of China are communists. CCP is the party. And yet the prime minister of the Communist Party earned $2.7 billion for his family in the last 10 years that he was serving as prime minister of a bunch of communists. So actually, they're capitalists. And they're just power holding on to power in a dictatorship, basically. And why would they want to not do that? Well, they would only want to not do that by understanding the current you know, socio-historical, technological nature of this planet. They have internet, people have cell phones. Everybody knows everything in the long run. They can censor them, but they are really, I, I was at a conference in Norway just now where a BBC guy, um, was talking about how this and that person lost power in this that part of the world because somebody took a cell phone picture of them doing some wrong thing and so on. And I mean, it, he was saying basically to these, this was a corporate conference to the corporation leaders, that their message and their behavior had to fit because sooner or later, you know, BP could go around saying we're beyond petroleum and we want to take care of the environment and be nice. And meanwhile, there would be cell phone pictures that would be viral all over the planet of their oil rigs floating over and crushing a bunch of polar bears and so forth. And that would, or you know, their thing blowing up in the, in the, in, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So, so the point is that it's too late in history and the technology of the world is such that the old definitions of power politics and why would a powerful person ever surrender power uh, are no longer applying actually. You know, there has been no re there was no reason for the white people in South Africa to give up apartheid. There was no reason in the power politics level. Impossible. Bunch of weirdos doing divestment. Who cares? You know, we've got the guns. The Soviet Union should not have left Eastern Europe and or let go of the, the... They were in the Ukraine trying to persuade the Ukrainians that the Ukrainians were Russians since the 19th century during the time of the Tsars. So similarly, the Chinese will always fail to persuade the Uyghurs that they're Chinese. They will fail to persuade the Tibetans that they are Chinese. They will fail to persuade the Mongolians that they are Chinese. 
and they will fail to persuade the Chinese peasants and the Chinese workers that they should be good communists while the Communist Party members are being good capitalists or actually extreme capitalists. You know, they will not be able to persuade them either. So the reason they should make a decision to go with reality, you know, like old Deng Xiaoping, he said, seek truth from facts. So the facts on the ground are that imperialism is not cost effective in the 21st century. Just like world wars cannot be conducted in the 21st century. Even if you had enough people, enough cannon fodder, enough nuclear weapons, enough things, to think somehow numerically you could overwhelm the Europeans, the Russians, the Japanese, and the Americans, and the Indians, and, the, and the, I guess it throw in some Arabs, uh, a few Arabs, uh, you, you, you know, you realize that the technology of it is such that the whole planet would be polluted permanently and you couldn't enjoy living. It's like they're wealthy now, but they would all prefer to move to some place where they had a green economy because they can't breathe in Beijing. They have 775 level pollution where you get sick immediately in your lungs. You get asthma immediately. Even if you're the body boss, you're like, <laughs> you can't even enjoy your like champagne or whatever they're drinking. And uh, so, this is why they would do this, because there are some of them now, the daughter of the current president, or soon to be president and head of the PLA, is at Harvard University, and she's got a cell phone. She probably got Samsung and Apple both, and she like, knows what's going on. And he's going to be facing his daughter, and he can't carry on like a kind of Al Capone type of communist capitalist. It won't work. That's the reason in my view. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like what Tendo, I just want to say one thing, I like Tendo's idea that the Tibetans actually are showing the world something very powerful. I've always said, I've always had a slogan in my completely unrealistic religion professor, anti-power politics, geopolitics, which is I've always said that world peace will be achieved on this planet when more people are willing to show the heroism of giving up their lives without harming other people than are currently willing to fight in armies and you know in Iraqs and places like that and give up their lives while killing other people. In other words, a nonviolent warriorhood. And I do see the immolators in Tibet because you know the Chinese are trying to say they're terrorists, they're trying to say Dalai Lama sent them, which is all false. Anybody would tell them not to do it, any Lama would tell them that. But once they do it, you have to say there is a case of someone saying this game of domination and oppression is not worth playing. They're not really protesting because they're not going to be there to hear somebody's response. They're leaving the game. They are transcending the game. They're giving their lives. So those are people, warriors, who are sh giving their lives rather than fight. And so that's kind of a message that there are human beings on this planet that would rather be free. What, what was it? In America, we have a guy, a famous guy, who said, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry. And everybody admires that in America. All oh, those senators, they go there, they're saying, give me a golf game or give me, <laughs> and give me, more, give me more campaign contributions. Now it is. But still, give me liberty, give me death is really what moves people on this planet. And, though, and that is unstoppable, and the Chinese people have that ability. And the Tibetan people are leading the way I do say that. Although I think realistic autonomy is what is the middle way, is what to ask for. But on the other hand, there would be no middle way if there weren't some people asking for Reality. So go right ahead. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, I I put uh, my two points here. One is uh, what uh, do Tibetans want, and I think uh, the Tibetans and the Shu uh, uh, get cultural survival, uh, religious uh, and, and integrity, and also economic uh, prosperity and the political freedom. And so whether an uh, uh, and, and the overthrow of Chinese colonialism or the uh, complete independence of Tibet or the full sovereignty for Tibet is going to deliver. So now, um, in terms of the full sovereignty for Tibet, I think it's, uh, uh, the conflict is not only with the Chinese. I think the conflict also is with the Indians. And so this is not only about and, uh, whether Tibet and can is they have a clear cut and from the Chinese, but also whether to get a clear cut from the Indians. And then also I'm from uh, the region and uh, Sichuan province. And so I know and, uh, and the uh, Tibetan Chinese border is not uh, clear cut. It's not like, oh, Tibet and the autonomous region now can be uh, independent. 
it's not the case. And because and from Qinghai to Ningxia to uh, Sichuan and Yunnan, and all their borders, you have the Chinese and the Han people, uh, and, and also uh, Tibetans, and also some other minorities, they are intermingled. So my um, question is, and if we are going to try to separate them, and I'm not talking about you see, how the uh, 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 diffi uh, process can be difficult, I'm talking about the human tragedy. And uh, I'm thinking about and what scale is going to happen. Not only the Tibetans are going to kill uh, Chinese, the Chinese are going to kill Tibetans. And so I don't know, and this uh, human uh, uh, scale, uh, what kind of tragedy we're going to take. So this is one thing. I don't think it's a political, a geopolitical concern. And second, also, I want to uh, uh, talk about this. Because uh, uh, self-immunization uh, clearly is playing an important role on the psyche of the uh, Chinese people and the Chinese intellectuals. And so just uh, the day before yesterday, there was one Chinese and had self-immunization in uh, Wuhan and in a train station. So we have seen and, uh, at least uh, more than half a dozen cases of self-immunization happened and within, uh, among the Chinese people. And so this is how I think and, uh, uh, now uh, the situation is if we support the uh, freedom and the independence of Tibet, absolutely it's going to help the Chinese democratization process, no doubt about it. And because it's a high bar, right, if we can achieve that, and uh, so we can achieve Chinese uh, democratization. And also we can see the collapse of Soviet Union and the uh, worst attributed to four major uh, factors. And one is the uh, national ethnic independence movement. And uh, so I think and clearly the Tibetan uh, uh, freedom uh, movement is uh, making contribution. But I think at uh, uh, this moment, uh, uh, the, uh, just we have to think about, and the Tibetans has uh, uh, six million, uh, and so uh, uh, Chinese has 1.3 billion. And uh, uh, so uh, I think the, the, uh, the tragedy, if we allow it to happen, this is why I uh, try to get uh, involved in the uh, uh, Chinese-Tibetan dialogue. I try to say, get closer to His Holiness Dalai Lama. Because I think and somebody on the ground, we are going to need people and who can mediate the conflicts at a small level and between the Chinese and the Tibetans. As so I think that's the problem. It's not about, you see, an uh, uh, independence or freedom. So now the independence of freedom, maybe they cannot deliver and the economic prosperity and the religious integrity and the cultural uh, uh, future and for the Tibetan people. And also I want to uh, point out is, uh, the Chinese uh, government, I feel, and is hopeless. And, uh, and I, and I said the problem is they have lost you see, the ability of reasoning. And especially under atheism, they have launched you see, an attack against Tibetans. And under you see, uh, 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 pragmatism, and, uh, uh, and they have uh, uh, finished this uh, oligarchic translation. So to some extent, today's the Chinese and the entrenched uh, 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 interest, I think, is against the uh, uh, welfare of the Chinese people. And so I think at, at this moment, and for the Tibetan people and for the Chinese people, I think one easier way is how we are going to have an orderly transformation and in the, uh, in today the PRC empire. No doubt PRC is an empire. This should be ended. But how we are going to find a home for the Chinese and Tibetans to reconstruct their citizenship so they can gain their rights of citizenship. And I think and the home is not an independent and uh, 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 Tibet with full sovereignty or an independent China proper with full sovereignty. And I don't think it's going to happen in that way. And, but I think a better option and is available than is the European style and, and I said, and the wedding cake uh, style of uh, uh, governance. Especially I think, and if we uh, think about uh, uh, cosmopolitanism, if we think about uh, the uh, compromise and the, the cooperation between India and China, and in which the Tibetan and the Ken played a buffer zone uh, uh, role. And so the Tibetans do not have to clarify or rigidify and the, the borders and the, to assert their uh, sovereignty. And, uh, uh, but I think if we are going to keep this fuzzy and the concept of Tibetan as a buffer zone, as more is the autonomous and the cultural zone, and with uh, uh, blurred uh, borders with both China and India, so I think and if we can create a non-military peace zone in between India and China within the, uh, the context of Asian Union, so I think maybe this will work better for Indians and Chinese and those Tibetans and also other minorities in the highland area. Thank you. Yes, very good. <laughs> um, Tendo, two minutes, please. OK. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think. 
one of the main problems with the idea of uh, you know federated uh, federation solution or um, the Asian federation or whatever you want to call that right is um, it is it is founded upon the um, a, a relationship of subordination and I think that is the source of uh, future problems and in a way what's what scares me about such a solution is uh, it looks to me like a postponement of many other conflicts. At the same time, it also seems like a modern version of, uh, of the patron and priest relationship uh, that was itself the source of many problems in, in Tibet in the past. Uh, at the same time, I think, you know, it is, we aspire to have these post-national discussion, you know, uh, post-national uh, future, um, these are concepts that are things that people aspire to. But for Tibetans and for Chinese, I think it's a very difficult thing to grasp because we have not yet escaped from the colonial period. Uh, we are not living in the post-colonial period like the rest of the world. We are living in the colonial period right now. And that makes any discussion of post-national issues and concepts like really, really fuzzy, more fuzzy than the buffer zone, you know. Um, and and I would, in response to Robbie's question, I would say in terms of change happening and in terms of the Chinese government allowing all of these different uh, possibilities to happen, um, I think there are, in, in general, when uh, these political change takes place uh, between the powers that be and uh, those who are trying to shape change. Um, one of the leading theorists of nonviolence, uh, Gene Sharp, he talks about four mechanisms of change. And the first mechanism of change being conversion, second being accommodation, and then coercion and disintegration. And an example of conver uh, with this case that we are in right now, I think the two possible ways of this happening for Tibet is through coercion or disintegration with the Chinese government. Um, conversion and accommodation are both impossible. Conversion, one example would be in the past, hundreds of years ago, when the Tibetan lamas were able to convince the Mongolian rulers that they should have a special policy for Tibet and hand it over to the Tibetan people. That would be an example of conversion when the Dalai Lama was able to convince uh, whichever Khan was ruling at that time. To, in today's world, with today's Chinese government and the Politburo, that is impossible. Uh, accommodation is also impossible. So the only two options would be coercion, where we make the cost of occupying Tibet, the cost of oppressing the Tibetan people, so expensive. And that's where the Tibetan people are doing their best to make the cost higher for the Chinese government, and we need the help of the world. We need the help of the corporations, the people, the governments like the US, all of these uh, the congresses and parliaments to increase the cost on the Chinese government, economic cost, political cost, social cost. And at some point, when that cost becomes higher than the benefit, that's where we can have one of those possibilities. Another situation, the, the other, uh, other situation could be disintegration, where the Chinese empire itself is unable to sustain itself, where we see all the signs that the Chinese government is approaching that kind of moment. You know, uh, one, of, uh, one of the Chinese scholars, uh, Ming Xin Pei, he is one of the people who argue that if you look at the structure of a dictatorship, any dictatorship, it is very difficult for them to last beyond a certain lifespan. And you look at the Soviet Union or the Taiwanese dictatorship or the Mexican dictatorship, all of these dictatorships in the past, there has never been a modern uh, dictatorship authoritarian regime that has lasted more than 74 or five years. And the Chinese government is already 63 years old. And so we are looking at a moment where, you know, we have social issues, social unrest in China, the explosion of the internet, more than five, 600 million Chinese online challenging the Chinese government and not accepting the information that is spoon fed to them. You know, the income inequality. Um, so all of these things are coming up at a time uh, when the Chinese government is aging. So disintegration of the empire and the regime is also a possible scenario in which case the Chinese government and Xi, people like Xi Jinping are not even in a position to negotiate with us. They're gone. 
Thank you very much. Well, it, we're advancing into it, these difficult questions, difficult concepts, ideas, the fuzzy notion of citizenship, the post-national, the, the, the zone of peace, uh, the wedding cake uh, of government, uh, and the, the options of disintegration and coercion. It's up for you to decide, are we hearing utopian idealism from our panelists, or are they telling us about things that could really happen? Or are they just trying to delay uh, immediate questions? Or are they giving us answers that could actually bring solutions to uh, the Tibetan-Chinese dispute? We're going to come back to this after a break. I invite you now to uh, rest, to stretch your legs and relax. Uh, we'll begin again in about five minutes' time. Thank you very much. For your questions, we're going to ask you to limit the time to about one minute or maximum two minutes each, so people have time to ask questions. We've only got a short time left. Please. Hi, hello. Thank you all for your uh, great, healthy, and open discussions. They're very uh, informative and, I think, positive. Um, I come from a Buddhist perspective. Uh, as a, a Buddhist practitioner, I'm not very much involved in politics these days, although I lived in Nepal for 20 years and worked in Tibet also so much between the uh, US State Department and the Tibetan Ministry of Science. So I've had some experience of that cakewalk, what do you call it, a wedding cake, so to speak, but uh, wasn't much of a cake back then. Um, what I, I came back to America to build a Bodhanath Stupa, which is more gearing towards uh, what uh, Rob, Professor Thurman has been saying about basically the world's interdependence. That's his basic message. And the costs of freedom or the costs of uh, war, for example, or how they don't work. They're not cost effective. Disagreements are not cost effective. And we get right away into a discussion that, uh, or a question that rises in my mind. Now we have a range ranging from the seniors and um, relatively seasoned politicians to, and I'm not saying you're not seasoned, but down to the youth representation, which is always filled with vigor and hope about the correct future for the planet. Uh, we always know that uh, people, older people tend to mess things up before, you know, for the youth. But at the same time, the question comes about dialogue, its qualities, and the chances for it. In other words, I've never been convinced that I've seen situations where the dialogue is occurring, you know, the public doesn't know much about how the dialogue takes place between the Tibetan government in exile, I guess we'll call it, and the authorities in Beijing, for example, it seems to us that, or to me, that the, the Tibetan speakers, for example, people who speak Tibetan or English, and then there are the Chinese who really don't speak much English by and large and don't speak Tibetan. So the language barrier is there immediately. Uh, there's a cultural barrier. Moreover, moreover, there are not too many arenas, like the UN is not an arena for them to sit down. They need to do it maybe what types of uh, steps are being taken by both sides that allow for, for example, you say you want to, it's, it's good for the Chinese, I think uh, Robert Thurman said, um, that the Chinese need a better PR, what is it called? Uh, PR advisor, so that they know how they're being perceived. Uh, I think that's very astute. Let's, and, let's so, try and get our panel to answer so, these questions. So what, so what kind of circumstances are yeah. there for dialogue and what can be done to increase those so that the quality of the it's dialogue... It's an important is really, question, yeah. yeah. What are the practicalities of yeah. actual contact? Yeah. Let's take a second question uh, before you give your answers because, so that people don't have to wait so long. So Hu Jintao's replacement just gave a speech. It was reported on in the New York Times. Is this on? You can hear me? Yeah, it's fine. Um, it was reported on in the New York Times. And, and in this speech, he warned other members of the quote unquote Politburo, so to speak, uh, that uh, not to go the way of the Soviet Union. And uh, he laid out um, ways to enforce the perpetuation of the communist state in China. And uh, it never occurred to me until this moment that that might mean that there are pressures within China headed toward the Russia 
solution. In other words, headed toward the dissolution of the communist party because otherwise why would he be saying this? So on the one hand, there's the hardliners position, which he has just announced. And on the other hand, there's a suggestion that he has to say so. How would you formulate that as a question? The question is, do we have any sense about what's going on in China that would suggest that there actually is some kind of push toward the Soviet Union dissolution model? Excellent. So we have two concrete questions. Um, what are the actual modalities of contact and dis dialogue and discussion between the two sides? And what are the signs, are there any signs, of a dissolution towards the Soviet outcome? Let's start with uh, Lop San Yendo. Well, in terms of the Sino-Tibetan dialogue, we have been, uh, been having it for the last uh, uh, almost, you know, we have had in different phases though. The last or the recent phase was uh, from 2002 to 2010. We have had uh, 10 rounds of talks with the Chinese uh, authorities. But ever since then, now it's almost over three years, uh, the dialogue has effectively Seized, and uh, you know the Chinese leaders are not uh, showing any positive gesture in terms of re-establishing the contact. So, which means we really cannot do much at this point of time. But at the same time, uh, in the past experiences that we had in terms of uh, contacting the Chinese authorities, they are extremely cautious and sensitive in terms of where the dialogue is being held in what format and who will be the participants. So in that way, uh, you know, it, it's kind of not of our choice where we would, uh, you know, love the dialogue to have. So in that sense, the, you know, China has much to say, but at the same time, we, uh, you know, uh, make it very clear from our point of view that, you know, we have one official delegation of His Holiness, which the Chinese leaders have to talk to and not to, you know, any other, uh, you know, person who tries to, you know, uh, act on behalf of Tibetan people, and uh, you know, I really don't see any uh, sign of, you know, Chinese communist regime, uh, uh, you know, uh, dissolving similar to that of the Soviet Union. Uh, it, it's obviously I do not have any authority in this subject because I really do not. Uh, 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 you know, uh, study uh, the Chinese uh, politics much, but at the same time, you know, reading from what uh, experts are saying, what the U.S. government is saying, uh, you know, it, it seems that you know China is getting stronger and stronger and more powerful and powerful each year. And I say it, uh, you know, the China is going to supersede United States by the year 2030. Is is, is a report, I think, from U.S. intelligence. It's uh, and also, you know, there are experts who who feel that the communist regime in China is also growing by numbers every year. Uh, it's, it's simply because not that the Chinese people are supporting the communist regime simply because they s subscribe to the ideal communist ideology, but they. S become a member because they know that you know by joining communist party they have lots of perks that they, you know their career is established so in that way 100 million chinese communist members would not like the communist party to collapse for their own personal benefits so this is one sign where, where i see that china you know communist regime might continue you know for 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 a long time who else would want to do it? Do the rest of the panel agree okay, with Lawson Yenda? Or you have another view? Okay, uh, let me uh, uh, respond to these two questions. You know, one is uh, whether an effective dialogue has been going on uh, between Chinese and uh, uh, Tibetans. And I think, and, uh, and I can uh, uh, say uh, in a positive way, because I think uh, I was involved, I was dragged into this dialogue process. Right? And, and I can say and for the past uh, uh, several years, and His Holiness has tried to promote this dialogue, and especially and to try to send his message and to the Chinese communities. 
And uh, uh, in this overseas Chinese communities, and especially the epistemic communities, I think and they have become a conduit and for the Chinese and to send messages back to China and also and to uh, play the role of bridge and between the Tibetans uh, and living exile and also the Chinese living uh, in China and the Tibetans living in China. So this, I think, and is very positive. I think it's going on. And I, I, I think and now more and more and, and scholars, and especially, as I said, and if we look at uh, this uh, magazine, they put uh, uh, Tibetan self-immunization on the cover page. And this is a big move because uh, basically this topic has been a ta taboo and for the Chinese uh, media, right? And so and I was uh, lucky enough and to be part of this uh, an, uh, issue. So I generated and um, contributed one an article. And the second, uh, with regard to um, Xi Jinping and his concern, and I think and the, the Tibetan uh, and, uh, rebellions uh, so far by using safe emulations, I think have been very, very effective because they have made the Chinese government so helpless and look so stupid and so brutal, so repressive, right? And if we just think about if uh, Tibetans are going to and uh, shift back to the strategy they used in 1950s, I think that was wrong. It was proved a failure, right? So this is how I think and this is a, a very effective. So the question is how we are going to amplify the message, especially how we are going to make the audience, the Chinese audience, to act and to jump out uh, of the seat and say, okay, we should do something. And so I think and today we can see the ground uh, shifting and uh, movements within China. And uh, one thing I want to say is uh, the 21st century is going to be Chinese century, I think it's uh, uh, not going to happen. And uh, uh, President Obama said we are not going to be number two country. And uh, so uh, you can see how the uh, big movements, I think, are uh, 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 the, the wind, I think, is changing. So I, I can say and the, the United States and China and are engaging in uh, conflicts at four uh, different levels. One is ideological conflict. So if you look at major uh, newspapers in the United States, they have, for the past two years, they have intensified their coverage in a very negative way and uh, include a lot of exposés about the Chinese high level and the corruptions, including Xi Jinping, including Wen Jiabao, the prime minister, the party secretary. And so I think this is uh, a declaration of war. Even and, uh, and, and, and New York Times just started their Chinese version of New York Times. I think this is big. Second, we, we have seen the uh, cyber warfare. And I think it's something big and it's going on. And then the third, I think, uh, if we uh, look at what's going on in, in terms of uh, over in uh, Diaoyu Island and the South China Cedar Island there, and I think in terms of uh, naval uh, encounters, I think something big and is going on. And so then uh, I think there is uh, another important thing is and, uh, uh, if we look at what the United States done to Iran and with regard to the cyber attack and also currency warfare, and so actually a bigger currency warfare is going on between China and the United States. So this is how I think and some big and, uh, things are uh, changing. So one thing I want to say is, and uh, I have taken too much time. One thing I want to say is, and the Tibetan uh, uh, issue, I think, and uh, uh, share some common challenges with the Chinese democratization movement. So because today's the Chinese regime, I think not only is a problem to Tibetans, it is also a problem for the Chinese. I think it's today clearly and it has become a global problem. And so this is why I think if more and more people are going to despise and, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, more and more people are going to pay attention to what's going on in Tibet and in China. And I can say the, the big change and it's going to happen. But do you think there's going to be a dissolution of China and the communist China? So that's, the, the, I think the problem is not whether the, the Chinese communist regime is going to collapse or not. Absolutely it's going to collapse. The problem is how we are going to prevent the collateral damage. Because of the heavy weight and how it's going to hurt the Chinese people and hurt other people and also people in the neighborhood. So that's, I think, the most important concern. Okay. It's not about and whether Tibetans they can become free or I'm not. Rephrasing the answer. Should right, we sorry, can I just add one thing? I don't want to really just address those things. They both uh, very well. I just wanted to say, this goes back to the earlier thing about disintegration. I think that... Um, it, 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 maybe it's just my opinion, but I believe that it is worse for Tibet if China disintegrates. It's because people, there may be some people in the movement who think that that'll be good, then we, Tibet can break free. But actually, if they disintegrate, it goes back to regional warlords like it was during the nationalist period on and off. 
And in that case, you know, like Mabu Fang was there in uh, Turkestan, and there would be different ones in Sichuan and mm -hmm. things like that, and they would be like a wolverine in a, in a cave. They would be controlling Tibet and extracting resources from Tibet, and there would be no one with whom to make a decision to make a sensible arrangement with Tibet. So the Tibetan movement, and I'm sure, I believe His Holiness thinks that way, is much better served by a, a Chinese government voluntarily doing a kind of reconstruction and uh, changing their policy and, and bringing it up to date rather than by disintegration. The Tibetan movement is not well served by that yeah. and therefore important. does not wish for that, actually. I, important point. Wants to deal with a strong yeah. China. Yeah. Let, let, do you want one half a minute? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie really doesn't like me. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do I can it. Put up with him. One minute. Uh, well, you know, I just wanted to say, um, I think, um, you know, the, the collateral damage uh, in, in Tibet in particular, I think, uh, or also the, if the Chinese empire disintegrates, what happens to Tibet? Uh, do we go back to, are we gonna see again the Mapufang uh, period warlord kind of era, or are we gonna see something else? And uh, actually, like my take on this is actually far more hopeful because um, in terms of a Tibetan national consciousness, the Tibetan political consciousness that we have today is completely different from the Tibetan national consciousness back in the 18th century or the 19th century. You know, there was these hundreds of years in uh, pre-modern modern Tibet uh, before 1913 when uh, Tibet was factionalized into various different pieces and uh, that that kind of problem is uh, sort of inconceivable in today's world because of the national consciousness that has sort of um, percolated thanks to His Holiness and also largely thanks to the Tibetans inside Tibet and their resistance, including the self-immolation, the chapter of self-immolations. One of the uh, highest achievements and results of the self-immolations has uh, been not only to make the Chinese government exposed, but also to unite the Tibetan people in a way that we have never seen before. And um, the only other thing I would say is like regarding dissolution or disintegration of the Chinese government, I think all, a lot of the signs are there. And although the Chinese government uh, leaders in the government might say, we don't want to go the Soviet way, that doesn't reduce the chances of them going the Soviet way. Even the Soviet Union didn't want to go the Soviet way. Um, so I think we should keep these things in mind. Um, <coughs> And uh, only last thing is, I agree with Mingxia about um, the effectiveness of the, 19, the, the uh, tactics used in 1950s by the Tibetan people and you know, armed resistance. I think that period is over and uh, right now, nonviolence is far more effective than violence, not only because we believe we have a principled belief in nonviolence, but also because there is hard data and statistical research that show that over the last 100 years of all the movements that have used nonviolence versus armed resistance, 26% um, of the armed movements were successful and 53% of the nonviolent movements were successful. So we are in the right place right now. Thank you. So I won't use violence to keep them quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, panel members, you're going to have to be brief in your answers so we have time for our questioners because we're running out of time. Let's have the next question, why, why please. Why don't we let them go one, do all the questions? Yeah, all the well, let's do three at a time. Response. We'll Maybe do three. All, all at a time. Let them uh, give their comments. All of the all time. Together, yeah. We're right. going to do all the questions at a time. I've been pushed here. <laughs> let's take your question. I appreciate your focus on time. I want to remind you panelists with your stress about time that we're just wanting to hear more from you. <laughs> so you're doing a great job <laughs> revealing deeper. Um, I see in, um, in the Soviet Union you had a rigid system, but you had um, a boycott in Poland that was very united uh, in Poland and that started everything running and you had nonviolent movements in, in East Germany and nonviolent boycott action. It was a big factor in South Africa too, but in both situations you had numbers on the ground Afri in South Africa, native peoples, and in um, Soviet Union, many, many nations. You also have that situation um, in, um, in the, the American Re Revolution against the British Empire, but you, you don't have a lot of numbers of people in Tibet. That factor is pretty big difference. Um, just like the Palestinian people's numbers are small. 
and that has not been successful. The economic factors too, there has never been a way to, to, to weaken the economic factors in, in Israel, but in each of these other countries, in South Africa, in the Soviet Union, with its rigidity and self-implosion, you had economic force and boycott. So where would that boycott come from? How does one boycott China as on, an, on an international level? And where would those numbers be, if not in the Tibetan people, that would create the factors needed for the pressure to change without, uh, clearly it's not going to be a, a violent, but, but even nonviolently, there have to be numbers, pressures, and economic activities. And uh, where do you see those coming from, particularly Tendor, since your, your, your hope and plan is that it be actually uh, the biggest change that anybody is suggesting here? Where would that come from? Thank you very much. Next question, please. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, so a lot of the discussion today has been about government, uh, and I kind of had a two-part question on a more <coughs> grassroots level, so to speak. Um, I just came back from five months in Sichuan province, and one thing I noticed one night in a hotel room in Chengdu was that while all of the Chinese TV stations were playing game shows and uh, soap <coughs> operas, the one Tibetan language station was playing for about, well, for the whole evening, um, shows about uh, heroes of the revolution and a biography of Mao. And uh, the following morning when I turned it on again, it was a Chinese language lesson. Um, so I'm wondering if you could shed some light on the effect of this kind of media propaganda on Tibetan people within Tibet and what the effect of that might be in the future. Uh, and the second question is, um, also, as I visited to some different sites, I noticed massive numbers of Chinese tourists coming um, to Tibet, and and their kind of very <coughs> strong interest in um, buying all sorts of trinkets. And it seemed to me that uh, in talking to some of them, Tibet was becoming quite trendy, uh, so to speak, among Chinese people. Uh, and I wonder also if you could speak to the effect of the kind of trendiness of Tibet among some Chinese uh, middle class and uh, the kind of commoditization that they uh, demand of Tibetan culture to bring back gifts back to their home. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, two, two more important yeah. questions, please. Hello. Um, uh, the uh, discussion about uh, coercion being important uh, in the, in the uh, nonviolent model as one of the methods to uh, persuade China to let go of Tibet. Uh, kind of creates in your mind uh, a situation in which it becomes more expensive to hold on to Tibet. Uh, the expense, the cost outweighs the benefit. So this raises in my mind a very simple question, and that is, what is uh, the national interest to China of holding on to Tibet? How can that possibly be strong enough to, uh, uh, to counteract the, uh, the trouble? Thank you. Another important point. Please. Thank you. I wanted to make a comment about the early remark uh, from uh, Dr. Barnett about we can't tell what's happening in, in Tibet because we can't go there and verify. I'd like to see media, uh, international media, refuse to uh, give a government position on events if that government is keeping media out. So the only thing we should believe about Tibet, if we can't go there and verify, is what the Tibetans are getting out to us and not any government uh, counter narrative. So that's one thing that we could ask our media to do, is always affirm the voices that are crying out and saying there's pain if we can't get in to see that that's uh, to, to verify that for ourselves. We should believe it when somebody's keeping us from, from seeing it. The other point is that for me, I see the differences between the Chinese culture and the Tibetan culture in very broad brush as being differences between a very materialistic focus on life and a spiritual focus. And I think in that equation, the people of Tibet have already won because the nonviolent actions of the Tibetan people under the 
threats and the oppression that they're experiencing is a spiritual light uh, for themselves and for the rest of the world. And I think it has an effect on all the other conflicts that we may see around the globe to have uh, this people, six million against over a billion, actually stand as the leaders. Uh, and I'd be, the question I would have is whether bringing in uh, strategies of nonviolent direct action as a strategy cuts against that notion that what's happening here is the people of Tibet actually becoming monks and nuns and making their spiritual action their statement. If it's a tool, if it's a, if it's a strategy to achieve an end, then it's actually a materialistic uh, approach. And so I would ask us if we can look at that. OK, that's a new point. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to address two points that were brought up. Um, one is um, regarding the peace zone. Could Actually, you speak into the microphone, please? Oh, sorry. Um, it's related, uh, the idea of peace zone and the idea of Tibet as being a country more like a model of good, eco-friendly behavior and spirituality. My question is, is such a model possible under the circumstances under globalization and under the information age, where information is so re readily available, can we live? Can Tibetans live up to that model? If we do become a, let's say we become an independent, I mean we gain that peace zone and we become an autonomous region, can we live up to that model of eco-friendly behavior and spirituality? Can we? Thank you very much. A very realistic model, please. Well, question. Uh, Come close to the mic. Okay. All right. So my question is, like, what do you think about the political situations we'd be like in the future? Speak. Like, can you speak closer? All right, my bad. Uh, what do you think about the political situation we'd be like in the future? Like, currently, countries are ready to like grab each other's neck. They have like nuclear weapons and bioterrorism, where everybody is like ready to like kill or destroy each other. They want to be on the top, and they don't have time to like help any other countries. So like um, in this reality, what do you think about the political movement would be like in these circumstances? Thank you. Two questions. One is several of you have mentioned that the self-burning is putting pressure onto the Chinese government. And is my understanding that the Dalai Lama has not explicitly condemned these actions? So I would like to hear about that. Yes, he has. He has it. We'll, we'll come to that. Okay. Let's, let's bring and that up. And my second question is, I know in the West there's a lot of discussion about support to Tibet, but I mean, I cannot judge it, but how much is there actually an effect of all this discussion in the West about free Tibet actually on the freedom in Tibet? Thank you very much. These are provocative, important, and actually practical questions. I'll, may I run through them very quickly? Should I do that? The first. Is there the economic weight or the numbers to actually have boycotts that would work? Uh, what is the role of propaganda, the Chinese media uh, impact on Tibet? And what's the role of Chinese tourists and the commoditization uh, in Tibet? Um, coercion, what is the, um, wh 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 at what point would the cost outweigh the benefit for China in its national interest? Um, how could we create an, a world in which there's a spiritual example point in terms of people joining monasteries inside Tibet that doesn't get undermined by this political uh, ab objective. Uh, the peace zone, is this realistic? Could Tibetans live up to that ideal of being stewards of an environmental country? Um, how would a political reality work in the new world of terrorism? And what is the Dalai Lama's real position on these self-immolations? I think I've captured at least some issues here. Let's hear our panel, please. Who would like to go first? Hmm? And you have each about two minutes oh. for your answers. <laughs> All of those questions. <laughs> you, you just well, let me just say one thing. The one thing is that from the very beginning, the Dalai Lama said that he didn't think it was effective, it wasn't a good idea to, to do these simulations. Yeah. yeah. 
And um, I remember when the Indian, the guy in India, Ngawandundra, uh, or whatever his name was, not Ngawandundra, but the guy in Delhi in the 1990s. Oh, Yeah, Tutankhamun. And he was so upset at Dalai Lama after that. And he came to America right after that. It was the time of the Kundun movie. And he said he got to the hospital before he died. And he said, well, you had to do that. You know, I'm sorry, but you did it. It was your statement. But please don't die with hatred for the Chinese in your heart. And the guy thought it was like this. He was all in bandages, you know, like a mummy. And then Dalai Lama said, oh, I really worry about this. This is really terrible. He said, the kind of energy that this takes to do that could easily turn into terrorism. And I'm very frightened. You know, he was very unhappy about it. Let but he, he hasn't said that this time. He, what? He hasn't said that this time. Oh, he did. He said it would be not effective. He didn't think it was. He was in Japan. At the, I remember yeah, very he, clearly. Yeah, he said he that. He said that. But he has also said it's like this thing that people do in violent war where they, have, you know, like the, the American invasion of Iraq was an international crime. Everybody with any brains knows that. It was a completely fake invasion. It was criminal. These people will be prosecuted by history as war criminals who went into Iraq. It was a useless waste of money and, and life. But nobody will say because people died. So then the president can't say that because then the people died for nothing or they died for the crimes of their leaders. So similarly, these people who did immolation, they have families. And also there is a tradition in Buddhism of giving your life to something higher. It isn't a strategy. It isn't even a protest. It's saying this situation is not correct. It's not a good situation. I seek another life. I'm, I'm asserting my freedom. You can't oppress me and you can't kill me. I can kill myself though because I'm free to do that. It's a very profound statement that only hits other people on the unconscious, therefore it's not a strategy. What that lady said is right. It's not a strategy. And, the, and so the Dalai Lama can't condemn after they do it. Anybody comes up to him, I can run up to the Dalai Lama and say, Your Holiness, I think I'll immolate myself at Bard College during the thing. Shall I do it? He, of course you say, what is, what's the matter with you? you know? You're a grandfather. You've got work to do. Like, use your suffering and practice the Dharma and don't go immolating yourself. And so he does condemn as a basic thing. It's not in the Tibetan tradition particularly. It's in the East Asian Chinese tradition of Buddhism, and Vietnamese did it. The Tibetans haven't done it up till now, so that's why it's so powerful. Okay, that's about immolation. Then about uh, what other questions? How many more? Well, questions? Let's give them okay. a chance, and right. we can yeah. come back to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, and and one, that's a very important <laughs> thing. And it's very paradoxical. You're off the mic now, Bob. And I will not <laughs> accept any implication that the Chinese try to make that the Dalai Lama is putting these people up to it, or any other abbots are putting them up to it, because they are not. Anybody who wants to do that, if they ask any of their senior people, they will say, "Don't do that." Let's move on. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I think for Tibetans, they don't have a bad and good choice. I think the choice is defined by what's bad and what is even worse, right? So this, I think, uh, self emanations are in that choice set. Now, let me say a few things about propaganda and Chinese culture. And I think the Chinese propaganda has been very strong, very effective. So this is how many uh, Chinese people, including my family members, including a lot of my colleagues, they are the unconscious carrier of lies and the falsehood. Falsehoods. So this is how I think our debate, and we try to um, uh, highlight the, uh, the discussion on safe emanations. We try to you see, uh, discuss about uh, uh, truth seeking. So what's uh, you see, uh, the true information we should get? And so um, I believe and uh, both uh, Tibetans and, uh, and, and Chinese, they have been uh, controlled and by the propaganda. And so now uh, and I'm not uh, completely pessimistic about the Chinese because what's going on is and when you see the Chinese uh, tourists, they go to Tibet. And so they have developed uh, and, and some kind of love. And uh, this love is not only uh, for uh, uh, something exotic and uh, strange, but actually this is a part of Chinese people's self-spiritual uh, great awakening. And so I think the Chinese people, if you look at uh, how many uh, religious people they have now, and if we, uh, we see the underground uh, Christian movement, we see the Falun Gong, and we see the Tibetan uh, uh, Great Awakening. So I think uh, the, uh, the Tibetan uh, uh, today, their uh, fight for freedom and their you see, uh, 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 sacrifice are uh, uh, putting something big into the consciousness of Chinese people in this process of great self-awakening. Uh, and then uh, also, the difference between the Chinese culture and Tibetan culture. And I do not want to say uh, uh, the Chinese culture is really uh, 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 secular, the Tibetan culture is spiritual. And I want to say the communist Chinese culture absolutely is atheist 
and is materialistic. But the Chinese culture and all the, and uh, we talk about exo age and civilizations, including the Chinese civilization, they were based upon the great religions. And, uh, and so also I think and the Chinese and now, they are, you see, returning to religions because of the moral crisis, the spiritual crisis, uh, it's hunting the Chinese people. So this is why I think because of this great moment for the Chinese, I really think and the Tibetans and Chinese, they have common ground and to work together. But of course, I'm not going to and, uh, deplore the collapse of the Chinese Communist Empire because look at the collapse of Soviet Union or communist regimes. No collapse has created a worse regime than the previous communist regime. So this is why I'm not going to say and we should prevent it from uh, collapsing. Right? Tender, tender. Oh. Just this particular topic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you should do the cost topic. The national. What's when does the cost become excessive for China? I'll do this first. Okay. Do <laughs> I think because it's a it's it's a really urgent, uh, you know, compelling situation with the self immolations, and um, and of course everybody agrees that the the way in which it's exposed the Chinese government for its cruelty and repression, that is that is an achievement the way in which it has united the Tibetan people uh, in, for, into this unprecedented uh, national unity, national consciousness, that is an achievement. They may not be material, they may not be immediately visible, they are huge achievements. And I think there is another major achievement uh, that the self-immolations have made, which is back in 2008, when there was the uprising in Tibet, I think everybody will remember the way in which, you know, people like Professor Mingxia, uh, they are rare among any, any public. You know, there is like in any public you look at people, whether it's the Chinese public or other people, they are the thought leaders, the opinion makers, and the writers and the intellectuals and the artists who are usually at the front of new opinions in the making. And there is a handful of them. But for the rest of the people, People can be convinced easily. People get carried away. People get emotional. And in 2008, when majority of the Chinese people saw the uprising through the lens of the Chinese government, CCTV, they became really upset. They became really angry. And many of them, they sort of unleashed into this huge battle online, criticizing the Tibetan people, criticizing the Tibetan government and Dalai Lama. And uh, there was this huge madness, in a sense. Right now, with the self-immolations, all of those people, online or in the street, somehow they have subsided. Where are they? They're missing. I haven't found them. And I think, in a way, there is a difference between a street protest and a self-immolation. If there is a street protest, it is very easy for somebody to say, these guys have been brainwashed. And if my government tells me that these guys are evil and they've been brainwashed by exile, or the international forces, I would believe that. But if you are taking your own life, if you are burning yourself and dying the most painful of death in order to express your opinion, in order to demand something, and if my government tells me, oh, she has been brainwashed by His Holiness or something, I'm not gonna believe that. And I think in that sense, this primal you know, action and the imagery of the self-immolation has somehow neutralized a huge part of the Chinese public's um, irrational or defensive kind of feeling toward the Tibetan people. And that's, that's really a huge, subtle, invisible, but huge um, fundamental achievement on which future uh, genuine dialogue or future possibilities are really going to hinge upon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you. But I'll briefly touch on two issues, two questions. Uh, one uh, is about uh, you know, the, the, the friendship between Chinese and Tibetan people, particularly when there are lots of Chinese going into Tibet. Uh, you know, we really emphasize a lot in terms of building friendship between Chinese and Tibetans. You know, my colleague, Kongatesh, is here, whose responsibility is simply to reach out to the Chinese community. And Professor Shaming just said that you know, people, Chinese ordinary people are making lots of efforts in many ways to build friendship and understanding and trust among the two people. I've been to Tibet and uh, you know, m many of us have been to Tibet and we can feel that the animosity, the, the atmosphere of animosity inside 
Tibet against Chinese people are quite strong. But then Robbie has rightly stated, you know, government is not people, right? So, so the Chinese people are also, in large way, they are innocent. And we are extremely grateful to many of the Chinese, you know, uh, scholars, thinkers, uh, you know, who have been supporting us in our very difficult time. Let's say the Open uh, Constitution uh, Initiative, you know, who brought out a report after doing a thorough research or study of Japan play to of you know of the 2008 widespread peaceful protest. You know, they have you know, strongly supported the aspirations of the Tibetan people. And similarly, the, the only Nobel Peace Prize winner, Liu Xiaobo, and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, I think Wang Lishong, they started an open letter, right, which was, which was signed by so many Chinese scholars and thinkers and lawyers, you know, all in support of Tibetan people. And today, we still continue to receive so much of love and understanding from the Chinese pe people. So that's what we really wanted. That's what His Holiness dreams for. Ultimately, with the Tibetan and Chinese people, we have to live together, future generations and generations to come. We cannot separate our geography. That's one thing. So that's why we are putting importance to you know uh, uh, building more and more friendship. The other question is about the self-emulation, which is extremely important. What I felt initially was there three things that Chinese government did initially when self simulation started. People are trying to divert the main issue you know, of self simulation but you know, it's, it's not the, the one you know, uh, gentleman here asked about you know, whether his son is condemned or whether his son is made an appeal to stop self simulation or not. But these issues, from my point of view, is not the primary one. His Holiness is all concerned about you know, I, I, I tell it publicly that there's no one in this world who is more concerned than His Holiness on the plight of the Tibetan people. And one Chinese friend, when he was in Dharamsala, when he met with His Holiness, His Holiness shook hand with him, and at that morning, His Holiness said a simple word saying that another Tibetan has died this morning. And he saw tears in the eyes of His Holiness at the time. So he had written it publicly after that. So which means, you know, all of us know that how hard and you know how, how worried his holiness is. But the issue here is Chinese government is always trying to belittle the the the, the, the peaceful struggle movement of the Tibetan people. Initially they said those who are self committing self emulation are either thieves or they have a you know insane kind of you know mentality, or sometimes they have they have a criminal record. But when, when that was not kind of you know, helping them, they started blaming His Holiness and the exalted Tibetan leadership, saying that you know, they are the one who is you know, behind all the self-formulations taking place in Tibet. Now again, when this was kind of you know, not help, helping them, they have decided that all self-formulations is against law. It's a criminal act. So those who are related, their families, their neighbors, their friends, are being arrested in hundreds and hundreds. People were imprisoned for long years. So that's what they have been doing. But fortunately, all the policies of the Chinese government is proving wrong. They, initially, they felt that by December 10, they were able to stop self emulation in Tibet. But unfortunately, self emulation number has again rise, risen. So which means that unless and until the Chinese government really addressed the core issue of the suffering of the Tibetan people, they cannot fool around any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unless members of our panel have a strong urge to make a final comment, uh, we should close. Are you happy for us to? A final comment? Do you need to make a final comment? No. No. Oh. <laughs> but I'm, I, if I made a final comment, we'd never leave. That's true. <laughs> we'd never go home. Robbie, I'm, like it's Saturday. Uh, but. But, but uh, you know, just let's all cheer up. That's all. The bed will be fine. I really like Professor Ming Sha. He's really, they really have you on a list. He's really, they're really exceptional. I, I wanted to say one of this, I do want to say one thing about that. I thought I'm, you might. I'm especially happy. Use the microphone. Said, microphone. I'm especially happy that you said that you didn't accept that Chinese people are all materialistic. And we know that. There are just as many Chinese religious fanatics as every other kind of religious fanatic. 
They've just been suppressed for so long, and they've been. And actually, Mao made himself into God. Yeah, so he wouldn't. He didn't want any other competition, and Jiang Zemin therefore freaked out about the Falun Gong unnecessarily, and etc. But the Chinese people, there's a lot of them love the Dalai Lama. They go study Tibetan Buddhism. They run out to uh, to Leirungar and these kind of places by the thousands of them. And I think a thousand. And Taiwan, they go completely nuts. Yeah. So that one I really like. And then the second one, you know, about you being so exceptional. Of course, you are exceptional. But on the other hand. I do believe, personally, it's like the Lotus Sutra. There was one guy who listened to the Lotus Sutra in the Buddhist scripture, you know, the famous Lotus Sutra, and he got so excited, Lotus Sutra is so great, I want to go teach Lotus Sutra to everybody. He got all excited. And then Buddha said, calm down, everybody's cool, the Lotus Sutra is being taught, look around you. And he looked around and he saw giant bodhisattvas coming up out of the ground like blades of grass. That's like grass, like, you know. And so I do believe that the Chinese people have been traumatized and suppressed by a kind of criminal gang for some period of time, <laughs> very unfortunately, you know. And they, and they are scared to really have their own conscience and their own feelings. But they're finally getting sick of it. And there's many people who will really love the Dalai Lama, will love the Tibetans, will support the Tibetans to have their freedom in whatever relationship, autonomous or federation or whatever it is. And... Uh, there will be an extraordinary change that will come very soon, I think. I really do. I think we should be optimistic. We should expect it. We shouldn't hold them to, like, they have to fit a certain stereotype. Do you know what I mean? So that way we can be encouraged. So there we have an optimistic okay. note. And finally, Tendor would like to make one brief comment. Very brief, because uh, somebody asked if the global movement has an impact on Tibetans inside Tibet. And one example. Uh, that I hear again and again uh, when we meet Tibetans from Tibet, what they keep telling us is, please tell the people around the world to keep making more noise for Tibet because it really makes a difference for them. And they use the example of uh, East Turkestan, the, what the Chinese government calls Xinjiang. And they say that Xinjiang, in many respects, is a, in a worse situation than Tibet because for Tibet, there is a lot of global actions taking place in the rest of the world. And Paulin Gyatso is another example who says after all these years in jail that there were years or days when he remembers better treatment from the prison authorities. And when he was released, he looks at the calendar and he was able to tell that every time he was treated better in prison was when there was a major international campaign. So please keep up the effort and the pressure because eventually it makes a huge difference. And the Tibetans inside Tibet, they are engaging in non-cooperation movement and boycott movement. And somebody mentioned that that might not be enough. And that's right. It makes a huge difference, but for them to be successful, for them to reach, uh, to increase the cost to the breaking point, to the critical point, they need the help of the world. That's why we should also engage in economic boycott, in political pressure on the Chinese government through our representatives. So please uh, keep that in mind. And we have a petition on the Students for a Free Tibet table over there. Please go and sign that petition uh, encouraging multilateral action for Tibet, encouraging world leaders to intervene in Tibet, because nothing short of that would be enough. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We have run well over time. You have been extremely patient, uh, and you've been very generous in your time and very thoughtful in your questions. We haven't been able to answer all the questions you raised, which were excellent questions, especially from the younger people, the younger Tibetans. We have to apologize for not answering those questions. We also have to apologize for not being able to include in our discussion all the many voices that are part of this issue. The Chinese people who are not like Ming Sha, who may view their government's actions as correct, we find it difficult to get that voice into this discussion. Tibetans from inside Tibet, who can't really take part in this discussion, who we don't really hear their voice, we have to hear it uh, through their representatives uh, and their activists outside. So this is a hugely complex issue which we are just starting to touch. You will have to decide for yourselves how much of this is rhetoric, how much of this is dreaming, how much of this is practical, how much of this is actually uh, seeing a realistic future. 
Uh, and these are all difficult questions that we hope will lead to a positive resolution both for Tibetans uh, and Chinese, and as Ming Xia pointed out, for other peoples in the region as well. I'd like to thank all our panelists. I'd like to thank Bard College. And I'd like to thank our host, the Kingston Tibetan Center, and all of you. And we'd like to thank our moderator for being so moderate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I give you my card, right? Yes. Okay, good. So send me email. Okay, good.